So good morning and good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for joining today to this uh, second webinar organized by the NJAtlantic.eu project to uh, present the first open call uh, for funding um, uh, to carry out experiments on using EU uh, or US experimental platform in, in the next generation internet field. Uh, so the webinar today, uh, in the webinar today, you'll see uh, different uh, speakers. Uh, first of all, I'll leave the floor to Jim Clark uh, from the Waterford Institute of Technology. He is the coordinator of the NGI Atlantic.eu uh, project. Uh, he will be then followed by uh, Kobus van der Merve from the University of Utah in the US presenting the Powder uh, platform. And uh, then we'll give the floor to uh, Brecht uh, Thermolin from the University of Ghent, who will talk about the uh, Fed for Fire Plus platform. Uh, this section will be then followed by um, a proposal speech uh, moment, where we'll have four uh, speakers. So Joost Afterhoek, uh, Bart de la Tower, Mishko uh, Zitik, and Brecht Vermeulen again. And we're, uh, we will then open the floor to um, any other uh, people who, who want to present a, a project idea, who are looking for partners and would like to launch uh, a call uh, for partners, a search for partners, and or uh, any of you who um, has any, any question about this uh, first open call. Um, the, your microphones are muted so far, but we kindly invite you to raise your hands using the um, tool you have in your uh, dashboard in case you want to, to speak and we'll be happy to, to open your microphones. Uh, I am Sara Pittonet from Trust IT Services and I'm also one of the partners involved uh, in the NGI Atlantic uh, .eu initiative together with the Waterford Institute of Technology, Euriscom from Europe, and the University of Utah and the Rutgers Universities from the United States. Thank you again uh, for joining us today and I give the floor to Jim. Jim, up to you. Thank you, Sarah, and welcome to everyone to our webinar today. Um, what I'm planning to do uh, is I'm going to sort of breeze through these uh, slides on, on the, um, you know, the main aspects of the uh, open call. And um, I would like to spend as much time as possible on some of the uh, most asked questions that have come up uh, in, the, in the last number of uh, weeks um, from, from the participants. So just um, uh, broadly speaking, uh, the project is a 30-month project running from January 2020 until June 2022. And it's um, uh, through its open call to be funding EU-based researchers and innovators in carrying out next-generation internet-related experiments in collaboration with uh, US research teams. So there will be five open calls in total uh, throughout the life of the project. And uh, I'll discuss the um, um, the, the mechanisms and the open calls uh, in a few moments. So just some of the key features, um, as I mentioned, will be five open calls run in pretty much in a sequence with about a two, two month period in between them, just to allow the starting up of the, the winning uh, projects in the previous open call. Uh, there's 2.8 million euros funding in total for the five open calls. So it's um, an indicative amount of approximately 600K per open call. And the, um, uh, <clears throat> we also have an external advisory group and um, our, our external pool of evaluators that um, evaluate proposals. And there's a twinning lab, which I'll describe in, in the next slide. And then, um, Importantly here, we also do continuous coaching and mentoring throughout the pre-proposal phase. Um, so this uh, webinar is part of that. And we also um, answer questions on email. And also, um, if, if appropriate, we have one-to-one -one, uh, calls with uh, potential proposers. The Twinning Lab is a place where um, you can uh, potentially find a partner 
um, that is looking to find uh, another partner on uh, either side of the Atlantic. So um, the, it's an area where you can put some profile information and then you can make contact um, directly with, with the partners that are, are looking for uh, complementary partnerships. So this has been um, quite effective already. There's been a number of dialogues happening between different um, uh, proposers. Okay, so we, we invite you to, um, to participate to the twinning lab. Um, just some of the statistics. So the, as I mentioned, the first open call is running at the moment. It will be closing on the 29th of May at 1700 CEST. The evaluation will take place in June 2020. Uh, total in, uh, indicative funding 600k and the ex, um, expected start date of projects first of July and we'll discuss in a few moments um, you know, the, uh, you know, due to the COVID-19 crisis of course um, you know we might have to be flexible on this. There's two types of proposals there's what we call the long term or LT which uh, have a maximum contract duration of six months with a monitoring frequency of monthly and a funding range of 50,000 to 150,000. Then the short-term contributions project would be a maximum duration of three months with a monitoring frequency of uh, fortnightly with a range of 25,000 to 75,000. Then the eligible costs are personnel, uh, direct costs, which include personnel and travel, and then a flat rate um, um, indirect costs uh, similar to the H2020 flat rate system. In terms of the open call topics, the strategy here has been <clears throat> to uh, focus on the call topics um, that have already have some results coming out. Um, so in the NGI initiative, there has been uh, four projects already starting um, in uh, 2019. And these projects already have some results coming out. So the idea would be then that they could take their work to the next level in teaming up with uh, some excellent US-based um, uh, partners to um, run some experiments with their results. Now, um, obviously the, our open calls are open to new entrants as well. It's not just a, um, a, a, a project that is for the current running project um, projects. It's open to anyone um, that would like to participate. Um, so the call topics are um, privacy and trust enhancing technologies. Um, and again, with a focus on experimentation of uh, results on these. Um, decentralized data governance. So, you know, the leveraging this distributed open off hardware and software ecosystems based on blockchain distributed ledger technologies, open data and peer to peer technologies. And you know, with a specific focus on sort of the human, um, human and societal values um, that that we hold dear in the EU. And then the third is on discovery and identification technologies. So better ways of search and discovery, you know, accessing large uh, heterogeneous data sources, services, etc. Then, uh, in terms of experimental platforms, we just have a, a number um, of of samples here. It's not exhaustive, obviously. So on the EU side, there would be um, perhaps some of the former fire of future internet research experimentation activities, which um, then became sort of known as the NGI EXP. Then there's the Fed for Fire Plus, which you'll hear more about today, which is, <clears throat> excuse me, still up and running. Um, and, and, you know, a very, very um, good platform for this kind of activity. 5G PPP, you know, amongst others. And on the US side, you have um, the NSF funded wired and wireless programs, such as uh, Enter and uh, Genie and uh, a, new, a new one that started um, a few months ago called Fabric and Future Cloud Platform. Uh, then you have the uh, platforms for advanced wireless research uh, on, the, on the wireless side, and you'll be hearing about the Powder Platform today and then there's also the cosmos platform um, of rutgers university and columbia university as well then you know others like us ignite and then there was a call in 2018 um, from the nsf called internet core and edge technology program which was dedicated us eu so 
So some of these pro uh, projects from ICE-T are still up and running, and they're um, actually looking for some EU partners. And we're compiling these links in our twinning lab. So just the, um, some example on the uh, types of projects. So an example might be an innovator in the EU has developed an NGI-based solution to improve new ways of search and discovery, teaming up with the US-based experiment the platform funded by the NSF. So that, that could be a you know, possible uh, teaming. And then likewise, you could also have an innovator in the US funded by NSF that's developed NGI-based solutions on decentralized data governance that wants to team up with an EU-based partner who's also developed similar solutions and uh, team up for development and testing on an EU-based experimental platform such as Bed for Fire. Now, uh, in both of these examples, according to the funding rules in the EU-US implementation agreement, NGI Atlantic would only fund the EU-based partners uh, and the US partners will receive funding from their usual sources in the US. Um, either under their existing projects or uh, try to seek new projects, okay? Now, there's been a, a number of um, uh, frequently uh, asked questions, and I just want to go through some of the ones that uh, perhaps are, might be the more sort of sticky ones that, that come up quite often, um, and I'll, I'll give you a pointer later to, to where you can find more. So uh, who can apply to the open calls as an EU-US twin team and what is the team size envisaged? So um, the, the minimum team will, would consist of at least one private and one public organization. Some of the NGI initiative projects fund individual researchers uh, such as NGI Zero, which you'll hear about. But in our case, we, we, um, we will only fund um, organizations um, located within an EU member state or associated country, including the UK, and then twinned with the US counterpart for execution of the work program proposed. And <clears throat> please note that the NGI initiative is typically funding smaller teams. So that's typically, you know, one and one from the e one from the EU, one from the US, and then generally up to a maximum of two, you know, which, which you can um, explain um, and justify in your proposal. But uh, the NGI initiative basically doesn't um, use the word consortia uh, at all. It's, it's more like teams. Uh, who can make it the application and who receives the funding? So <clears throat> the application would be made by a lead EU team partner. So it's, sim it's similar, you know, to the, the, the way it's done uh, now. And the funding will be limited to coverage of the work to be carried out by the EU team, as I mentioned earlier, as per the EU-US agreement. Now, um, if, if on either side you require you know, one more uh, or more than one team member, as I mentioned, this you can, you can justify this in your application, okay? In terms of the funding, the lead EU partner will receive the funding from the, the project coordinator of Waterford IT and will be responsible to make the payments to the other, the other team members um, and you, you will um, be expected to have a consortium agreement with the team member. And I'll, I'll describe this in a bit more detail later because we, we can help you with this sort of stuff as part of our mentoring program. Can the EU-US twin team be affiliated to each other? This has come up um, a couple of times. So the answer to that is no. Um, if there's only one EU member and one US member and they are affiliated to each other administratively in, in any way, we don't feel that this would be in the spirit of cooperation envisaged in our EU-US open calls. Now, some, some of the ones that approached us actually had um, uh, an, an additional member, let's say in the US, that was not affiliated to, to the one-to-one um, the -one team. So in that case, it, it, it could be allowed, and, you know, as long as it's justified. Um, so, you know, in other words, you could have um, a company in the EU team, a company in the US team affiliated, but there has to be an unaffiliated team member in uh, the, the US, let's say. If the this is one that came up quite often as well. If the proposal idea doesn't precisely match the proposal call text, but it encompasses most of it and is still well related to NGI um, and the key enabling technologies of NGI, can I submit to the open call? So what we've been telling proposers here is that if the proposal matches um, many of the elements of the call text, but perhaps not precisely, 
as long as it's with um, a US-based partner, obviously, and accentuating the Internet of Humans concepts, pillars um, such as trustworthiness, um, you know, ethics, privacy, et cetera, et cetera, challenges being addressed by NGI, you should still consider to submit. But what we uh, ask you is you can make direct contact with us um, at contact at ngiatlantic.eu, and we can advise you on whether it fits the call or whether there might be a better fit elsewhere in the NGI initiative. And we, we can have calls to discuss this as well and help you through this. Um, this, uh, this is a, a very um, um, frequently asked questions. Where can the US part of the team receive funding? So the answer, because you, you know, we, we're using this uh, implementation agreement, um, the funding would be the responsibility of the US team member or a partner, I should say, and they would be aware of the typical funding sources that they could tap into. Um, now, of course, this is dependent on the team, uh, the partner type, um, whether it's industry or academic um, of the organization. So just some thoughts on what we've been encountering um, thus far in, in our you know, coaching with the different pro um, potential proposers. In some of the cases, we found that some of the US team uh, members have existing funds already for EU collaborations as part of their ongoing work. So as I mentioned before, the ICE-T program is still running on a number of their um, research collaboration projects or RC projects, and some of them already have some funds that they can still use with EU collaborators. Then, um, you know, the, for those that, um, that, uh, that, that are interested, they can put themselves up with the, uh, on the twinning lab to see if they can find some partners. Uh, in addition to that, the EU Commission is having continuous dialogues with the US NSF about securing another round of ICE-T or something similar, um, which ran in 2018. And I, I include a link here, so if you want to do a search on this, um, the, I, the current ICE-T projects, you can find them here. And then in, in the case where there's some difficulty in finding um, funding um, as part of our coaching activities we're willing to help u.s partners make a pitch to their current or future funding sources by um, explaining our project and goals uh, if that would help um, but again we feel that um, the partners themselves in the u.s would be the best place to actually identify their funding source um, and, and pass that information on to us what cost types are relevant for funding? I mentioned this earlier that um, we're taking a rather sim simple model here, direct costs, it's personnel and travel costs. Then the indirect costs will be flat rate overhead on direct costs, not to exceed 25%. Um, can I include equipment costs? Uh, no, we've, you know, we've taken the view that, um, you know, it'll just be personnel and travel and subsistence and the flat rate overhead. Can, um, can we include project management costs? Yes, you can. Uh, this can be included under your personnel costs, um, but it must be commensurate with the project size and follow the usual guidelines uh, of you know, no greater than five to 7% of the overall personnel costs. Uh, this is a frequently asked question. What if my proposal requires some research and innovation in addition to running experiments? Is this permissible? Yes, uh, we've been advising um, proposers. Um, however, with the caveat that we recommend that there is a good balance between R&I and the experiments in the proposed project plan. So for example, you can carry out the necessary R&I and plan some interim experiments during the project plan, you know, let's say at midterm or end of project. Uh, please keep in mind that in the NGI initiative, in general, it's geared more towards getting your NGI solutions up and running quickly in shorter terms uh, and leaner projects. And that is why there's a focus on experiments in our open calls. Can you elaborate on the types of travel envisaged? So for LT type projects, which is the six month duration, we're advising to plan at least three travels for kickoff with the US project team and getting set up on the experimental platform. Um, a midterm prototype experiment um, at midterm and then a final experiments and, and workshop, let's say. Um, there is some discussions already between ourselves and the fabric and some of the other large scale projects. 
that I mentioned earlier um, about having a face-to-face -face workshop in the U.S. towards the end of the year or early 2021. So there might be some scope that the um, the winning projects could also participate using their travel budgets. So that's why we're advising to include at least um, three travels for the, um, the longer term and then um, about two travels for the shorter term. Can we apply to another NGRE open call at the same time? This, this has come up a couple of times. So what we say here is we would advise you to make contact with us um, at the email and then uh, just to find out which would be the best fit. So for example, if your project idea requires a significant amount, amount of R&I before results are ready for experimentation with US partners, it will be best to focus on the other NGREs at this early stage before applying to one of the later NGI Edica EU open calls. Um, in any case, um, just, just be forewarned that the NGREs are coordinating together about their results. And while there is nothing to prohibit application to ngiatlantic.eu at the same time as application to another real call, under no circumstances will double funding be, um, be allowed. Uh, what is the situation regarding the ownership of the foreground intellectual property resulting from the experiments that will be conducted? So the, um, the generated IPRs will remain, will remain at the organization level, which is the similar model used in the previous you know, FIRE and, um, and other calls. So in this case, it's third party project members uh, um, accepted in the open call. And this is clarified in the third party contracts, which will be between um, the coordinator and the, um, the lead EU partner. Uh, now, since there is at least two partners in an EU US twin team, uh, one from EU and one from US, you will have to have a consortium agreement between yourselves on this matter. And we can help you with this aspect as part of our mentoring and coaching program. And also our winning projects uh, will be receiving direct assistance from our sister project, NGI Tetra, who are um, specifically involved with the technology transfer and harvesting of results of the NGI open call project. Uh, then, of course, uh, will the COVID-19 crisis affect the project start dates? This has come up um, many times. So at the moment, we're just, um, uh, we're still expecting the start dates of the funded projects to occur within one, one month of the contract signature. However, we are monitoring the situation closely. And as the NGI initiative is known for its agility, um, obviously we'll work with the winning teams on viable start dates and also will allow no cost extensions if needed as a result of the ongoing COVID-19 crisis. So um, this was just a sample and you know, some of them have actually come in the last um, week or so, so they might, may not be on the FAQ site yet, but there are a number of other questions uh, on the site. And, and if you still have questions, regardless of what's there, please send it to us um, as early as possible to the contact email and we'll answer to you as quick as we can. And if there's still time before the deadline, we can have the one-to-one -one, one coaching call with you to answer the queries. And as, as I mentioned, four more open calls are scheduled if you cannot make it for the first open call. And the second open call will open on the 1st of August, 2020. Thank you very much. And I, I turn it, here's just some quick pointers uh, for you as well. And I turn it back to you now, Sarah. Yeah, thanks, Jim. We received some, some other questions while you were uh, presenting. I hope I addressed them all, but just in case, I think it's useful to briefly uh, recap them here. So we had one from Fabrizio Villani. Uh, is it mandatory to make a consortium with an American company in order to submit your application? And I hope the answer was clear, uh, of course, yes. Uh, Fabrizio, let us know if you if you need any uh, any other information, and please raise your hand in case you need to talk. Um, then another question about uh, Sebastian uh, Peering about the Twinning Lab. So the Twinning Lab is a space we offer uh, to everybody uh, to find potential partners, but of course the consortium can be made up in any way. So if you already have contacts, um, you, you don't need to pass through the training lab, so 
this is a way we um, uh, a channel we suggest to um, establish new partnership in case you need and to offer you additional visibility. And other questions about um, the number of organizations that can submit a proposal. So there is not a given number, Jim, correct me if I'm wrong, but we suggest small teams. That's correct. That's the typical um, NGO <coughs> approach. And, um, and I think that that's it. So we, we will re publish the recordings of the webinars on the website and we will also uh, update you all via, um, via email and via our newsletters. Um, I also see there is a, um, yeah, a request for a pitch at the end of the session. So we'll take this on board, Dragon. And I suggest now we move on uh, with the agenda. So I'll now give the floor <coughs> to Kobus um, from I'll the University stop. of Utah. Yeah. Okay, I've stopped sharing now. Thanks, Jim. So Kobus will present the uh, Powder platform. Hi guys, uh, thanks for having me. Um, so. I'm uh, going to run through this pretty quickly um, and I will point out right from the get-go we have a lot more information on our website powderwireless.net and our uh, partner project Renew has their own, own website and I'll talk a little bit about this relationship in a second. Um, so broader context I, I think most of you know but just very briefly uh, Powder Renew is a project under the uh, NSF Power program. Power uh, stands for Platforms for Advanced Wireless Research. It's a fairly new program. It's been running for a few years now uh, with a goal to, to build uh, city scale platforms uh, in the US. Uh, we, our, our project is Powder Renew because uh, we uh, are partnered with a sub project from uh, Rice University called Renew. Uh, we were actually uh, competitors in the first round and uh, then in uh, when the uh, finalized things got finalized uh, we ended up as a, a partnership and they are providing some uh, massive MIMO equipment for the platform we're building. Uh, you already heard about Cosmos who was the uh, other team uh, that was awarded in the first round and uh, late last year a third a uh, platform called Airpo uh, was announced. So that's kind of the broader picture. Uh, so this is kind of the uh, cartoon picture of uh, what we're building in, in powder. Uh, so I'll just run through this real quick. Uh, so stationary radios, you can think of these as uh, first instance rooftop deployments. Uh, we also have a dense deployment coming up over the summer where this would be more at street level. So, uh, you know, think, um, traffic signs or lampposts, things like that. We have a private front hall, back hall fiber network to near edge compute facility on our campus. We also have a uh, fairly sizable research uh, cloud infrastructure uh, from an, another NSF funded project called Cloud Lab, um, which again, you guys might be familiar with. We have a small controlled RF environment. Of course, we connect to the rest of the world. Um, so that's sort of the fixed infrastructure, if you will, and then in terms of endpoints uh, to enable mobility or to enable wireless uh, interaction, we have what we call fixed uh, endpoints. These are sort of uh, human height uh, devices that are built onto the side of buildings and we're in the process of deploying uh, similar equipment on uh, buses on our campus to provide predictable uh, mobility and we'll also be putting some on, on, other, on other vehicles. So this whole infrastructure is software defined end to end. So, uh, you know, we have of course the cloud backend, uh, software defined networking technologies in the network. Um, we have software defined radios in our rooftops. Uh, we'll have software defined radios in our dense deployment. We have software defined radios in our endpoints. So software defined end to end, which is uh, a very important 
feature to get uh, the flexibility uh, that we need in a, in a test bed like that. This. So in terms of uh, city scale, uh, and this might not mean that much to you if you're not familiar with Salt Lake City where we're at, but uh, the red area here is the University of Utah campus. So that's where we started our deployment. Uh, so all this stuff in red uh, is what we have deployed already. The little snowflakes here is uh, where we have our rooftop nodes. Uh, I already mentioned the dense deployment that we will be doing uh, over the summer. Um, and then we'll be extending uh, over the next uh, year or two to the Salt Lake City downtown area. So we'll be covering like uh, three different uh, areas, uh, so to speak. The thick dark line here is a uh, fiber backhaul from campus to the University of Utah downtown data center. So we have 200 uh, gigabit per second links uh, or 200 gigabit per second links to the downtown area. That's where our cloud facility is. And we have two smaller uh, compute uh, facilities uh, on campus. Uh, this is a pretty picture showing the, the same area. So we think with uh, this uh, infrastructure, we can support a pretty broad range of fundamental industrial and academic research. I'm not gonna uh, go through these in, in detail. Uh, just quickly status, we focused um, first year on the things circled here in red. So the fixed endpoint, the rooftop nodes, fiber front hall. Uh, second year, we focused on the bus deployment that isn't quite complete, so that's still ongoing. Um, and then I'll just run through these. I'll not stop uh, to discuss them in great detail, but it's a picture of one of our uh, fixed endpoints. Uh, so there are a bunch of the stuff in green here. That's the experimental equipment. So software defined radio is paired with a small form factor compute. We have a monitoring SDR so we can make sure uh, our users are not violating FCC uh, spectrum requirements, uh, RF front end antennas, as you would expect. Uh, these are two of our rooftop nodes. Uh, we have uh, four SDRs in these, RF front ends with those, two different um, antennas, one banded, one broadband. Um, a little bit more detail on the RF front ends that we have uh, at the moment, sort of from the prototype to uh, the actual deployed instance. Again, I'll just uh, show the pretty pictures and not talk about it too much. Uh, this is our um, fiber front hall back hall. So this is a different representation of that of those rooftop nodes. We have the, uh, the, the four SDRs. We run CWDM over a private fiber from that to a near edge compute facility. So each of these SDRs get a essentially a, a 10 gig uh, colored uh, link or a lambda over the, uh, the fiber. And then we have a, a bunch of ethernet equipment and the compute cluster uh, behind that. It's a picture of our massive MIMO system. We currently have one of these deployed. We have two more coming. Uh, this is uh, the equipment provided by our collaboration with uh, Rice University um, and the Renew project. Uh, so this is a, we have e each of these pizza boxes um, has four devices in them. Each of the devices has two transceivers. And so for a total of 64 transceivers in, uh, in, in the box as a whole. Uh, we uh, mostly use open source software. So this is a sample of the software we have available in uh, what we call profiles, which are these recipes that uh, allow users to easily instantiate that. Um, this is a picture of our first uh, mobile deployment. So in the box there at the, oops, in the back of the bus, uh, go back. Um, and so, like I said, this is ongoing and has now been delayed a little bit because of COVID, but uh, uh, it is moving forward. Uh, so basically current status, we have eight of these rooftop, eight fixed endpoints. We have one massive MIMO uh, base station uh, with two of its own endpoints. We have the network and the edge compute deployed. We have a bunch of profiles. We have our monitoring in place. We have uh, been designated an innovation zone together with Cosmos, the, the first two in, uh, in the US, which allows us a little bit more flexibility in terms of how we use uh, spectrum. Um, and then uh, we have these mobile endpoints uh, deployed and uh, busy working on that. So uh, that's sort of a, a quick tour um, and uh, hope to see you using Powder soon. Thank you.
Thank you, Carbus. Thank you for the quick presentation. So for those who need more information on the platform, um, we invite you uh, to contact us, but uh, we can also already say that we're going to publish more information about each of these uh, platforms on the website soon. So uh, I now um, need to do a small change in the agenda. So we're going to switch the speaker so far. I ask Joost Achterhoek to speak now. And I can't really ask Brecht for more than just to stay there um, since Joost needs to leave early and we're running a little bit late in the agenda. So thanks Joost. So yeah. it's from Elanet is going to pretend, uh, present how the, what's the potential of taking the results from the NGI zeros uh, open calls into the US. Joost. Thank you very much. If just to check if correct, I should be screen sharing right now. Can you all see my presentation? Yes, we can. Okay. Yes, sir. Good to know. Um, so uh, thank you all for uh, meeting me uh, here today. Um, and uh, what I want would like to discuss with you uh, and present to you are the two open calls uh, that we are currently running as part of the NGI initiative and how that links into EU US uh, collab potential collaborations. Um, the two calls that we are running, uh, we do that under the name of NGI Zero. Um, we are focused on uh, supporting privacy and trust enhancing technology and improving search and discovery. Um, so that's this, and uh, all of this is being run by the NLNet Foundation, which is a foundation going back to the first internet working activities in uh, Western Europe um, and uh, the first for example, open internet connection established with the US. So again, there are some EU US history um, and I am employed by the Anonet Foundation to co-coordinate these two calls. So uh, here you can again see an overview and see that these two calls that we are uh, currently hosting are uh, two of the uh, first four uh, open calls. Um, a short description of how we do things. Um, uh, I just heard in the previous presentation that a lot of open source technology was being used, which is very nice. Uh, we also agree that the uh, NGI vision and the NGI program essentially quite requires uh, open source technology to a degree, of course. Um, and for us, that means that we require all projects that we grant to uh, generate open source building blocks and technology. Uh, even if it's just one part of a larger, for example, proprietary um, program, then the program or the part of the program that we will be uh, funding uh, needs to be open sourced at uh, some point in time. And um, other aspects that we feel are also crucial to uh, next generation internet technology uh, are, for example, inclusion, security, localization, uh, translation, and uh, more. Um, to uh, generate open standards and to be uh, have technology that can be easily deployed regardless of setup or configuration. For that, uh, all those things we do not do alone, essentially. That's uh, being done with a consortium of a lot of internet uh, stakeholders and experts. For example, Free Software Foundation Europe, the Nixos Foundation of the very innovative um, Nix uh, packaging system, um, and um, translation localization experts and uh, all those partners help projects that for us receive a grant between 5 and 50k at least for the first project um, to address all these very important uh, aspects of open source development this is our website we recently Just, reviewed it yes Just, sorry to interrupt you uh, uh, we don't see your slides uh, changing ah uh, can you um, see it now i, I see, we see only your first slide oh that but is anyway uh, the slides will be also available on the website so we yes will be sure maybe I they can... will be distributed even yeah, afterwards i am switching through them right now but indeed go check out our slides i will just essentially like describe the most important aspects of these both calls and um, how this relates to eu us uh, collaboration um, regarding uh, search and discovery um, this is a call that's very much focused on open decentralized and uh, user-centric search and discovery, um, where we believe that uh, one of the statements is that it should not be a, a gatekeeper, a black box, or a privacy nightmare, um, as search and discovery are just basic human needs and uh, need to be fulfilled also in the internet uh, environment. Um, we take a very um, 
we feel comprehensive approach to supporting uh, projects for this goal as that we are both focusing on uh, supporting technical building blocks. Uh, I saw in the earlier presentation, if I'm correct, like a GNU radio um, um, uh, program being used. We, for example, support the GNU name system, uh, which is a very like fundamental um, transition from uh, traditional uh, DNS to a more uh, user-centric free alternative. Uh, also, end-user applications for anyone who might know it's of uh, Circs, which is a um, privacy-respecting uh, meta uh, search engine, like aggregating search results of a lot of other search engines to give you a more comprehensive view of what you're searching for while making sure that none of your searches are being logged, for example. Uh, and a lot of other things, uh, a lot of other layers in between that we all try to address at once by funding uh, well, a lot of different projects. Um, and some example projects that I wanted to show, but you can show, see right now, but just go through the slides. Um, for example, are uh, a project called LibreCast Live, which is an effort to uh, rank up the development and use of multicast uh, instead of the single cast um, uh, technology there that for the most part we are using right now, which has uh, a lot of um, issues with performance with stability and also with privacy. Um, the, this is a project that when it comes to the point of testing could very much benefit from uh, EU US um, collaboration, for example, like the Fed for Fire uh, testing network would be very um, fitting for that. And also with another project called IPv6 scanning, uh, which as a lot of you will know, so we are running out of IPv4 uh, uh, addresses. And at some point, very soon, come point, we'll have to switch to IPv6, uh, but scanning that uh, very larger address space is uh, quite difficult to um, scan and discover hosts. This is a project that will um, allow a approach to better map that space uh, within a reasonable time. Also here, uh, a project that could very much benefit from uh, US collaboration when regards to testing and um, platforms to further develop this on. Uh, and the same goes for privacy and trust enhancing technologies, which is, can be quite a broad uh, topic. And also this we approach with uh, on as many layers as we, uh, as we can uh, from standards and protocols um, and uh, like technical fundamental uh, building blocks um, up to uh, end user applications uh, and to middleware like, and everywhere in between. And, um, one or two examples from that that I could point out here is, for example, the um, effort uh, which is called Libra System on Chip, Libra SOC, uh, which is an effort to uh, create a, uh, a, a system on chip that is free and Libra to the bedrock, uh, in which all designs and um, software and hardware essentially at the end uh, will be uh, freely available uh, for people to adapt to use to study uh, for a well, essentially very trustworthy uh, machine, uh, which can then project that could, in our eyes, could well, quite benefit from uh, collaboration with other uh, such uh, open hardware uh, efforts in the US and elsewhere. Um, and a project to uh, enhance certain um, privacy um, and security properties of the off the record uh, protocol, which is being used in, for example, Jitsi, uh, a lot of people are using right now for, uh, private and safe uh, video conferencing. Uh, again, uh, a project that could benefit from uh, EU-US collaboration to make sure that all the tech factors will be uh, handled. Um, and I feel that that is like the most centric, central uh, message that I would want to give off here uh, okay. is that uh, projects can benefit from EU-US collaboration, uh, that, which we already quite do essentially in a lot of projects that are very international. Um, so do check out our open calls and um, try to apply for the upcoming one. Thank you. So uh, let's go back to Breck now, Molin. Uh, we're going to talk about the uh, Fed for Five Plus platform in, in Europe. Yes, hello, good afternoon. Try to share my screen. Yeah. Um, That's okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, so uh, I'm uh, Brecht Vermeulen from the IMEC Institute, which is a research institute in uh, Belgium and Europe. And uh, we are leading the Fed for Fire project. So the goal of Fed for Fire is to federate uh, test beds uh, in Europe. Um, so existing test beds. So we are not building the new test beds in the project, but we are actually trying to uh, get them easier to use. So that's the, the whole goal of uh, Fed for Fire. So to give you an idea, it's uh, about uh, different technologies ranging from wire networking over IoT over 5G, over uh, big data, cloud networking, et cetera. Um, and they are distributed over Europe, as you can see. Some testbeds also do support multiple technologies, of course. And depending on your exact needs or, or um, uh, uh, asset, assets you want to use, you can choose the testbed uh, here. So just to give you a quick overview, um, so on the top left, you do see like a wireless test bed, uh, also having mobile robots um, so that you can do like small mobility uh, in indoors experiments. Right up, you see a large cloud environment. So you can do large networking experiments, cloud uh, kind of experimentation. Uh, bottom left, uh, some uh, IoT uh, with smaller devices. Um, and right bottom, you see, for instance, a lot of GPUs. So for AI, this, this is quite ideal. So it's a broad range of uh, test beds which are available. And what is now the goal of, of the Federation? Why is Fed for Fire existing? It's actually to make it easier for experimenters. That's the, the, the primary goal there. Um, so easier means with a single account, single tool, you can actually use all those test beds. And of course, you can combine multiple test beds. Um, so sometimes it's easier to scale up. Um, sometimes you want to use special resources. You want to compare, for instance, wireless environments. Um, so that's all interesting uh, to use single accounts for uh, multiple test beds. This is um, just one type of experiment, so distributed cloud uh, with, with complex networking in between. You can just deploy your clouds on the testbed and just combine them and do some experimentation on that. Of course, all testbeds are remotely um, um, accessible so that you can do those uh, experiments from anywhere uh, in the world. Um, in total, we, we have about uh, 65 testbeds which are um, accessible through Fed for Fire. So you see here on the map. Um, so we do have access through Fed for Fire account and tools access to some of the US test beds, but also in, in other continents. Um, we do also um, very good monitoring. So the green ones are, for instance, at the time of the screenshot, the ones that were up and running, the red ones uh, were down or not accessible at the moment. Um, so it gives you an impression what, what we can do uh, from Fit for Fire. This is um, the JFET user tool, um, which is uh, the tool that can be used with, with just a single account. You can share, of course, experiments with multiple users, and then you can design your experiments um, where each box on the screen is actually a node. For instance, top left, you see like a, a complex uh, software defined networking example. Uh, at the bottom, you see combination of optical networking with, with, uh, with end, uh, end clients, um, et cetera. So this is uh, quite easy to, to use. Um, and maybe just for a couple of seconds, I can show how the tool looks like. So it's, uh, you start with like an empty canvas, you drag in some nodes, you can uh, double click them and actually choose your test bed depending on uh, the available nodes about the health of, of those test beds. And then you can just um, design your, your experiment, deploy it, and, and a couple of minutes later, you have actually uh, full root access to those nodes. So this is in a nutshell that Fit for Fire can offer. And you see um, some links on the website. So uh, fedforfire.eu gives an overview of test beds. And we do also have a documentation site where you find all uh, technical information. So that's uh, my five minutes, I think. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Greg. Thank you very much. Um, OK, so I would now move on to the uh, proposer's speech. I'm so I to get a tower 
from the OpenJS Jenkins portal. Um, okay, thanks so much uh, for giving me the floor. Let me share my screen. Hi, Bob. Good. All goes well. You can hear and you can see my presentation. So my name is Bart Delathauer uh, from the OGC. I'm here together today with uh, Tom de Bloch, where we're going to uh, do a project proposal called Farm to Fork Naming Authority. Um, quick word on the OGC. We are the location people. We're a global organization and thought leaders on innovation on location. We run interoperability initiatives and consensus-based open standards. Uh, we have open standards that are used worldwide and the legislation is built on them specifically as an example on environmental monitoring, earth observation, aviation, etc. What do we want to do? Um, first, a little bit of context. Uh, we're going to talk about semantic technology, linked data. So I do apologize for all the three, four, five, and six letter acronyms. Bear with me. Um, so linked data in the uh, realm of agriculture. What we are asking help for both in funding and making connections is to build a user interface on top of a VocPress to resolve terms across agricultural vocabularies using semantic technology on an existing OGC definition server infrastructure that you could all use uh, for inferencing and other uh, linked data technologies. I'll give you an example of what we want to do is so we have multiple vocabularies that sit in a variety of domains of practice. Uh, we have here is food on and uh, agrovoc, and they each define their own terms. And it's very difficult to search items, to search for terms across these uh, vocabulary. So what we want to do is to link these vocabularies so that when you search for a term on vocabulary foodom, that you can find the associated information in other vocabularies. And so we want to do that using the OGC definition server. And what we're using help for is how to build that user interface for that. Um, so that will speed up matching of terms, concepts, collections, and their relationships, I believe, in uh, the constellation we're here in today, that is topic two and three. We want to do all this work using open standards from W3C, ISO, IETF, and ourselves, and expose the very same uh, additional information using the same open standards. We use ELDA, SISVOC and uh, vocabularies uh, using uh, SCOS. Results will be added to an open source OGC naming authority. GitHub repo is here. And I include some additional information uh, on the topics that we have defined. Currently, uh, here are points of contact on the European side. Me, my, uh, I'm here representing the OGC in Europe. And so we're looking for connection points in the United States. Um, where uh, you know, they can help us with either building that UI, but also connecting us to that broader agricultural domain. And with that, I'll turn it back to you. I only have five minutes. Thanks so much. Many <laughs> I thanks. Hope I was... All right, appreciate it. Perfect. Many thanks, Bart. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. yes, all this information will be available on the website, uh, as said. So yes. let's move on to the next um, proposers, Mishko. I'll stop sharing. Thank you. Yes, thank you. So first of all, thank you for having me. Let me share my screen as well. So there we go. Can you see my slides? I yes. see people nodding yes. So let me start. So my name is Mishko Cizik. Um, I have a background in industrial engineering from the University of Twente, which is in the Netherlands. Um, and my team and I made a blockchain-based system that allows online communities um, to perform peer-to-peer -peer funding, saving, and gamified incentives. And uh, all of this by uh, uh, also respecting user privacy 
and um, and it enhancing trust between users. So so that's that's pretty amazing in itself, right? Um, so how does this actually work? So so very very quickly and simplified. This is what you get. Um, so first of all, number one, you have um, the end users who have an app on their phone. Um, so this is, uh, uh, these, are, these are the happy end users um, at number one. Um, then what they do is they um, pull funds. So they, they pull money in, in, on the blockchain in what we call the reward pool. So this, this is a smart contract which holds their funds. Um, it also has some mechanisms uh, to vote and also has uh, some elements to, to store and handle uh, uh, user reputation data. Um, next to it is our uh, API. So that's number three. Um, the API is, to you, is used to talk to external systems. So community software, an example is, is Slack. So um, you might know it is a, is a chat based system. Um, so, so what does this API do and allow you to? So it allows you to build rules um, uh, in your existing Slack community, for example, for which you can distribute back these funds under, under certain con conditions to your end users. So, so you can build triggers, if, if you will. So th these can be um, user-based, so people uh, um, entering some kind of condition. So like, let's say Mary wants to reward uh, Peter for some, for some reason. But even more interesting is automated rules, which could be sent by sensors uh, or some certain software conditions. Um, a question we get asked a lot is why use blockchain for this solution? Uh -huh. um, so there are a couple of reasons listed here. I will not read them. You can, uh, you can uh, look back to them in the slides. Um, but the, uh, the, the short story is that blockchain is one of the unique, has the unique properties that it allows for decentralized self-governance um, and also supports programmable money. And this is needed to make this type of systems possible. Um, our project has been, uh, we're very happy that it has been accepted to uh, uh, EU Horizon 2020 grant recently. So we are not yet part of NGI, but we are part of a the different EU Horizon 2020 program. Um, and this will uh, allows us to integrate into a community solution called Open Social. And Open Social has a number of customers, which include United Nations, Greenpeace, and, uh, and a couple of uh, other big nonprofits. And one of the use cases we are going to explore uh, together, so we're going to set up, and this is going live at the end of this year. Um, is a use case to, to apply peer-to-peer -peer donations. So these will be local communities working in towards positive change. So you can imagine a person doing a donation. This ends up in, a, in the pool. Um, and another group or organization or group of people uh, receives these donations under certain conditions, um, which can be automated or user-based. So very exciting, looking forward to, to making this happen. Um, we have a five person team. Um, I think we excel at uh, agile uh, development, um, working with customers to launch solutions uh, quickly. Um, and uh, so we're quite business minded and, and also focus on the user experience a lot. Um, what would be very interesting for us um, to partner within the NGI Atlantic program um, is towards partners which, which can help us set up privacy and trust experiments. So to me, the most logical partner would be one of the smart communities by USA Ignite, right? So, so look for any use case and develop it and experiment with it that involves uh, monetary incentives and uh, communal governance. Um, a bit more R&D focused projects would be um, applying zero knowledge proofs um, or something that's also very interesting for us, which is, is involves online trust, is the Eigentrust algorithm, which has been developed by a number of people at the Stanford University, I believe. Um, so that's my five minutes. Yeah. Thank you for listening. Thank um, you, Mishko.
yeah, you can reach me. Well, you can see where you can reach me. And you can also schedule a, a demo. So feel free to reach out. Looking forward to your questions. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank, thank you all for staying in, until um, the very end. For those who can stay a few minutes longer, I invite you to do so. And I'll give the floor to Dragon, who asked to uh, do a quick pitch. Dragon. Hello, you, okay. Yeah, yeah. it seems to work. Um, I'll try to share my screen um, like this. Oh no. Okay, does this work? Mm. I, can see. I, I see your screen, yes. Yes, okay, so let's see if that. No, oh no. I'm getting, I'm having difficulties here. One second. I'm sorry about that. <clears throat> well, it seems like my good fortune left me. Um, I'm fit but, to, yeah, to yeah, I will, I will just, I will just, and, yeah, yeah, I, I will, I will just do it um, without the, without the um, visual support. Um, so my name is Dragan Espenschied. I'm the preservation director at Rhizome, a um, digital art nonprofit in New York, um, but also actually um, um, a distributed organization across, um, across um, the United States. And um, we are partnering with Open SLX, which is a spin-off company from the University of Freiburg in Germany. Um, we are uh, working on the preservation of digital art and keeping digital art um, accessible. And um, let's see if this works now. I'm suddenly feeling adventurous. OK. <laughs> working on the preservation of digital art and um, increasing its, its portability, its uh, ability to addition it and to transfer it in between different institutions and, and actors. Um, I want to, oh, no. okay, here, yeah, okay. So um, we have launched this, um, one of the things that we do is the, was the Net Art Anthology that we launched um, two years ago that over the course of two years, we presented 100 artworks of, um, for, that were created for the internet, like from the 90s till today. But we have also worked with um, legacy CD-ROM software by here, for example, by the artist Theresa Duncan, which is a piece that was released in 1994. And uh, we have created basically an infrastructure and framework to present these pieces online, a streaming emulation um, that is running on demand on the public cloud so we can scale up if more people want to play this game. So this is like, a, this is like the, you usually also, you select if you want to, if your location is the European Union or the United States, and um, then you are connected to an to an emulated computer that requires no setup or anything, and you can access these artworks. Um, but it is also possible to um, use the same framework to present these pieces in a gallery setting, like here. Um, there are a few more examples of this. Like these are all classic net art pieces from the '90s, basically, which we also presented in in gallery settings. So there's a, there is already a bespoke level of portability that we have reached. Um, this is also, yeah, this is all an emulator. It's just connected to a legacy screen. Here are more examples of that. And um, our goal is um, to, to really streamline these processes so that we can include um, um, artists much more in the process. At the moment, this is very institutionally driven. So we want to make an exhibition basically and we we do a lot of the work for the artists, especially um, checking the, the handover of the piece, placing it in emulation environments and putting it on the cloud. And we have um, yeah, ideas how we can increase the, the portability of these environments and give the artists more agency, um, possibly using peer-to-peer -peer protocols and transferring these sometimes very huge, um, very, very huge environments and, and very complex environments. Um, and 
the the idea is also we we've got a lot of um, requests from artist estates because we are now in like in, in a place in digital art where um, the first it's a very young art form but the first people have already passed away the first artists and we are working with the first digital artist estates in and um, it is very interesting then for example to extract from how would we how would we extract in, in a private manner and then present it publicly an artwork that is located on an, a deceased artist's computer and how can we organize these these transfers how can it be presented in the cloud and giving just the right level of access and how can it be um how can it be placed in the gallery um so uh yeah, we have, we have kind of a lot of these um, things in place. There is this framework called EAS that, um, that we've also developed uh, in a previous collaboration that was um, um, funded by the NEH on the side of the United States and the DFG in Germany. There was a, a, a collaboration. So we are new to the, to the Next Generation Internet um, project. But yeah, we hope that we can, we can find interest in getting this project um, supported. Um, it had this, um, the same emulation framework, did, which also includes network preservation options um, so that servers and clients and all these things can be, can be put in a virtual environment um, is uh, so in some places already used for like, um, I don't know, typical office stuff or the like preserving old uh, SharePoint servers. But um, uh, this collaboration has really brought that, um, that technology to a larger audience and made it all very understandable. So um, I think that is, that is, a, that is a key um, attractiveness of our proposal. And that's it from my side. <laughs> Thank you, Dragon. Okay, I think we have reached um, the end. Uh, unless there is any question, any other question? Was there a second talk of me, uh, Sarah? Yes, Brecht. Well, you, you swapped my slot with... Uh... Oh, sorry, Brecht, you're right, apologies. <laughs> yeah. We have, yeah, your last, your last speech, yeah. Yeah, well, let me share. Startups, it's, uh, it's very brief, so. Um, um, so the question is now how to use Fed for Fire uh, test beds in, in the open calls, for instance. So uh, just briefly on that. So in principle, the test beds in Fed for Fire are open for open access, so for free access. Um, that, that comes with some limits, uh, especially on the number of resources you can use, but also on, on the support, which is best effort. Um, so that's um, actually everyone can, can use them. Uh, for research. Uh, but on the other hand, there's like a small learning curve, but also for more complex experiments, you, you will need to spend more time. So that's a bit the, the limits of open access. So if we go to open calls or other uh, funded or non-free methods, you can actually um, have um, or use more resources. You can have like premium support, but also consulting services. So for instance, how to upscale an experiment, how to repeat experiments, maybe learn faster what kind of resources are the best for your kind of experiments. And what Fed for Fire offers there is like a single point of contact. So we do have, of course, uh, the website and documentation, but we do also have like a simple email address where you can propose um, what you want to experiment, and we will bring you in contact with the right test bed. Uh, just for your um, to remember, um, the different test beds are owned by different institutes, so we are actually redirecting you to the right person, to the right test bed, to do your experiment, and then you can discuss with them, for instance, for these open calls, uh, what uh, what can be done there. Um, to give an example of a very complex experiment that we did um, in the past uh, between US and EU, uh, this was done on the Gini Engineering Conference 25 a couple of years ago. So what we did is we, um, um, well, try to, uh, to do a scalability experiment on video streaming. 
And so we use different clouds, different test beds available, both at US side. So you see Cloud Lab, um, you see other genie resources there, but also Amazon Web Services was used in that um, in that experiment. And then you see a number of test beds at uh, the European side, and we did layer two interconnections um, on uh, gigabit speed, where we actually connected different software-defined exchanges uh, with software-defined networking. So we deployed some clouds um, with uh, video streaming services and then used other test beds for the client side. So um, this was the principle. Um, then we implemented this like a backbone on the test beds. You can see here different uh, sites. For instance, Cloud Lab was used in there an iMac virtual wall test bed was used in there. And then when we have the backbone where we saw that everything was working, we tried uh, to scale up uh, with adding other resources on both sides of the ocean uh, to just uh, do the experiment. So you can imagine this is uh, quite complex to do. Um, uh, in the end, you can do some measurements, for instance, day night streaming, uh, etc. It's very complex. It's not something that from day one you can do on this testbed. And at that point, you will need some uh, consulting where we can help uh, to scale up this kind of experiment. Another example is, for instance, on virtual network infrastructure, a basic uh, scheme. But for instance, you want to use Open vSwitch or Click, or you don't know what to use for VNF. Well, we can actually advise you on there. Um, so. Again, here are uh, some URLs. The most important for this, if you want to use the test beds, start from the website or uh, send us an email through contact at fedforfire.eu. So thanks a lot for this. Thank you, Brett. Okay. Um, so I think that now we, we reached the end of the, of the webinar. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you to our speakers and to all of you who joined us. Feel free to write us should you need any, any questions about this open call or the upcoming ones. Thank you again and good luck mm -hmm. for your proposals. Bye. Thank, thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye, everybody.